What's up, everybody, and welcome to another summer edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. I'm Scott Bear, doing this remotely via technology with my partner in crime, Tori McElhaney. What's up? How are you? Woo! I'm good. It's nice to see you in your creepy basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some internet troubles and places with better lighting, so now it has a real, like, Adam's Family vibe to yeah. it right now, uh, which I tried to prevent by opening windows and turning on lights, but still haven't quite got there yet. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> uh, we're here talking to you in the middle of the deadest of all dead periods in the NFL calendar. Um, still finding plenty of topics about what is, I'm going to call an intriguing Falcons team with plenty of yeah. question marks. Last year we did, or, or last year, wow, time's really uh-huh. fast here. Last week we discussed some lingering questions between the offseason program and training camp. Now we're going to zero in on a topic we planned on getting to last week, didn't really have the time to address and that is training camp battles and which ones we like and kind of setting the stage for what's going to happen at the end of July. The reason why we're going to kind of jump ahead and really focus on training camp is Tori and I are going on summer vacation. Uh, uh, (laughs) It's very exciting. Uh, Me and the fam, we're going down to the white sand beaches of the Florida panhandle. Very exciting. And uh, Tori McElhaney going to Jamaica yeah, I can't wait to uh, do all the Jamaican things. My um, a college friend, uh, she is from Jamaica. So I'm actually going and doing like real Jamaican stuff. Like not just like going to a resort. I am doing that, but I'm also going to like live with her grandmother for like two days. So I'm very excited. <laughs> See, that's awesome because you do need a little bit of time relaxing on the beach with people just handing you drinks with umbrellas in them. But then you also need to like see the actual culture as well. Sounds like a perfect little uh, combination. Uh, Yeah, we're going to go find some white sand beaches as well. Let the kids run around in water that's clear, uh, which for someone who's used to the having my oceans on the left, uh, the water (laughs) in the Pacific, not quite so clear. But nonetheless, we're going to do all that. And then we're going to come back and really start the Falcons Final Whistle podcast every week until kingdom come uh starting (laughs) the week before training camp with a good preview and an announcement i'm not gonna give anything off but we are this this duo is turning into a trio we have a new falcons features writer very excited to introduce the only clue i will give is introduce him to (laughs) you guys you're gonna love him uh he's gonna be on podcasts coming up Uh, We're very excited to have them uh, and stay tuned for that announcement, which will come in the coming weeks. But let's get to the business at hand, Miss McElhaney, and that is training camp battles we have coming up. There are a lot of them, which is what happens when you have a roster in transition, when you are trying to build talent, as you've pointed out several times during this offseason, with a multi-year strategy. This was not a one draft and free agency period and fix. This is a longer term play. So you add people, then you add guys on prove it deals to get right with the cap. And what that strategy creates is a lot of question marks at certain positions. That's not a bad thing. Um, and I think it's going to push the level of competitiveness. It's going to make training camp, in my opinion, kind of fun because we're going to see a lot of guys really getting after it as Arthur Smith tries to establish a tone of if you want it, go earn it. Um, so we're going to get into all those types of things. We're going to hit the offensive line, obviously, maybe the linebacker core, the edge rusher. Not everything is about who starts, right? And then, mm-hmm. of course, as we do and will continue to do, we're going to talk some quarterbacks. Um, but nonetheless, Tori, what do you think? What's your number one uh, position battle or area where you're excited to see these guys really get after it this summer? Okay, so it's funny that you asked me this because I recently went on 11 Alive with Maria Martin, who's one of my fellow uh, ladies in sports uh, within the (laughs) Atlanta area, and she asked me the same question, and I said on TV, I go, with my whole being said, and I quote, the offensive line, and she laughed about that. When the cameras cut, she laughed about that for a while. She's like, I was not expecting you to say the offensive line. And I was like, honestly, I wasn't either. Either. And then you asked me, and it was the only answer that I really, truly felt like compelled to say. Because I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, quarterbacks and edge rushers and uh, linebackers. 
But for me, I kind of already feel like I have a good idea of who I would want where at those positions. With the offensive line, there's just a lot that I still feel like I want to see with that group. And a lot of people who I think will be coming and being a part of this organization and this roster prior to the start of training camp, which is something that we've talked about before. And so I really don't think we have a collective good look at what this offensive line could one look like and be once we do get into kind of the competition, the nitty gritty of it. I think we haven't seen that yet. So I say all of that to say that the offensive line, I know people are like, why in the world would you pick the offensive line as like one of your biggest like position battles? But I really, truly believe that. I really, truly believe that outside of like Chris Lindstrom and Jake Matthews, that the competition that we're going to see within the scope of this offensive line is going to be pretty intense. And, and I think that honestly, you know, we, I could be saying all this and we could get to the very first week of the season and the same five offensive line that we saw last year could be the same offensive line that we see in week one of this season. That could absolutely happen, but I want to see the process of getting to that point. If that's what it, if that's what happens. So that's my spiel. People can agree or disagree as they see fit, but that's where I'll be kind of, I think hanging my hat this uh, <laughs> this training camp is just watching the offensive line. Yeah, and I, I'm with you 100%. And I, I think that that to kind of uh, dovetail off of what you were talking about or to continue some of your points is that it, it brings up two important matters. Number one, we were robbed of offensive line competition last year because of injuries to Matt Gano, who never uh-huh. was a part of the – the uh, Falcons product last year and the fact that uh, Josh Andrews got hurt early, which moved Jalen Matthews back and forth. So we never saw competition at left guard, which I think they sorely needed. We never saw competition at right tackle because eventually Caleb McGarry just needed to take the job and they were so desperate for depth at the position. They were claiming Colby Gossett off waivers and they were adding Mm -hmm. Jason Spriggs late and they were doing a lot of things just to get the nine guys you needed on the roster when you wanted the competition at all of the positions that we're talking about and didn't get it. And I don't think that that created a lack of motivation in the guys who eventually took those starting jobs. It just left a less than desirable situation. Arthur Smith has alluded to it a couple different times that he has long-term visions and long-term development plans for, for young players like he did with Richie Grant. Jalen Mayfield got robbed of that long-term development plan and got thrust into it. So I, I think this is nothing but a positive. I think the uh, front office did a good job adding veteran talents with starting experience. You look at a guy like Jermaine Effetti and you think that guy did not come here to be a backup. No way. Right. He's a former first round pick who wants to kickstart, re-energize his career. He wants to reestablish himself as a starter. He's going to push at right tackle. He might push at left guard. I think that we're going to see competition at center because Drew Dahlman is a year above it. And as much as we talk about offensive line, and maybe people think, uh, can we just fast forward to the next chapter of this podcast, please, and talk (laughs) about quarterbacks? This is why you can't, right? Because if the offensive line is not good, if we don't have the type of competition up front, the running game will suffer. The passing game will suffer. Mariota or Ritter or whoever wins that position battle will be scrambling for their lives and therefore less effective. So without us paying attention to these position battles, without them pushing to be better, then you've got nothing else, right? And I think that some people understand that, but I think they really need to follow it. It seems weird. Drew Dahlman versus Matt Hennessy, Effetti versus Caleb, uh, McGarry, uh, Jalen Mayfield versus a number of different people, Elijah Wilkinson, whoever these names you'll get to know because we're going to write about them a ton. These position battles are important. To Tori's point, and then end of my rant, is that there's there's a definite possibility that we could run it back with the 2021 group, right? But yep. at least I think fans and the coaching staff will feel better that unlike last year where in- injuries messed everything up, these guys are going to have to earn that spot. It's not like, well, I guess we got to go with this guy. It's this guy went out there and proved it. And I think that that's going to be key. So as we look through it and we look at you know offensive line, we're talking about three starting spots that are uncertain. As we move through the rest of these position group battles, um, maybe it's less about starting 
players yep. and more about how the rotation is going to work out. So yeah. let's move to a sexier position on the other side <laughs> of the ball. Uh, I'm sure the guys who man this position will love me calling it sexy. Uh, but nonetheless, we're looking at the edge rushers here, right? They basically hit a hard reset outside of Ade Ogundeji. A lot of older veterans are out. A lot of younger players are in, including two rookies, Arnold Ebikadi, D'Angelo Malone, Lorenzo Carter. How do you see this one shuffling out? I, I think we have an idea, more of an idea than we do with, with the offensive line, but I still think it's going to be interesting to see how this rotation plays out, who's going to play a lot, who's going to be an accent piece. There's a lot that we still don't know here. Yeah, there is. And I think this is a position that is going to change as the season goes on. As guys like Arnold Ebiketti and D'Angelo Malone get more live reps under their belt, I think you could and should see them evolve in their first year and probably get more playing time as the year goes on. Nothing against Lorenzo Carter and uh, Ade Ogundeji. They're going to play a significant role in this defense as well. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you're exactly right when you say, you know, starters don't necessarily matter in my opinion. And I, I say that on the offensive side too. Like I know there was one time last season where, I don't know, somebody was starting. It was like Kyle Pitts was not starting. He didn't come out there for the very first play of a game, but it's because uh, the package didn't call for Kyle Pitts for that specific play, and then he ran out there in the second play. So I, I just hope – I just want people to get it through their heads that, like, starting doesn't necessarily mean anything anymore. Um, maybe it did at one point or another, but not anymore. Um, look at us both going on – soapbox rants <laughs> within five, the first five minutes of this podcast but in terms of the edge I think it's what's really interesting and something that I'm gonna very much be watching early on is the role of Ade Ogundeji yeah. I think Lorenzo Carter is you go you go out and you get Lorenzo Carter for a reason he comes to Atlanta for a reason I I would feel fairly confident that Lorenzo Carter is going to be the quote-unquote guy in the room um, but Adi Ogundeji is a very interesting, uh, piece of this room and a guy who should be fighting for a starting spot. He's in his second year in the league. Granted, he was a lower round draft pick last year, but when I was talking to Ted Monachino, who's the outside linebackers coach for the Falcons at one point last year, we're talking about a couple months into the season last year, he made the comment that has stuck with me this entire time. And he said, that they view Ade Ogundeji as the bell cow of the room. And That's he made right. the comment, he was like, there is going to be a lot of fluctuation, people coming in and out of the building. But you know that Ade Ogundeji, he's on his rookie deal. He's going to be here for a while. So if they were viewing him when they drafted him as the quote unquote bell cow of the room in the future, how quickly can you get him to that future? Is this the year that we see that happen for Ade Ogundeji? That's what I'm just as curious about, even when talking about Lorenzo Carter and when you're talking about D'Angelo Malone and Arnold Ebiketti. I think Ade Ogundeji may be caught up in the shuffle of talking about these guys, and he's somebody who I think is going to be very, very important to this position group as he grows. Yeah, it's it's he he's the wild card because I think if, if you look at the R lads depth chart or not like depth charts matter now or the AJC <laughs> depth chart which Arthur Smith brings up a lot and because uh, he likes to dig on D led which is funny <laughs> to everyone uh, when you look at depth charts now you see Arnold Ebikadi already in the starting lineup and Adi's got to look at that and be like I'm in my year two I'm not gonna just accept that right I, I think the expectations I just wrote a bare mail. Um, response to somebody saying, I think that Arnold Ebikati could be the defensive rookie of the year. And I just want to like slam on the brakes. Oh, man. I, I, I think that it's very possible that he's um, a significant player, that he plays yeah. significant snaps. He has all the talent. We don't know, right? Yeah. We don't know what he's going to be. And I think you really fall into trouble when you have to rely, even on second round picks, when you have to just assume, plop them in, plug and play, right? This, this isn't, especially if you look at edge rushers that you would think that about, there were three guys taken in the top six 
Yeah. <laughs> put those expectations on Kayvon Thibodeau or Trayvon Walker. Um, I'm blanking on the third guy, but um, nonetheless, you know, that for the guy who's drafted number 38, a guy with relative inexperience in the game, I think that we need to see something at least with pads on before we start throwing expectations on this guy, or even assuming that he's going to be a major player. I think it's going to be interesting to watch this group overall, right? You, you think D'Angelo uh, Malone could be maybe like a sub package specialist or what have you. We don't have an idea of how this group is going to come together. We just know that they're all very young. Even Lorenzo Carter's what, 26, mm-hmm. something like that. So yeah. you have a group and you wonder, can, can uh, Ted Monacino mm-hmm. bring this group together and build a young foundation in this room that can work together for three or four, uh, three or four years? Um, and if they, they have to do better than 18 sacks, they, they just do. And Dean Pease said it extraordinarily well. Sometimes you just need a guy who can win a one-on-one, a one-on-one matchup without a scheme, without a scheme help, and just go get it. Are these guys the personnel to do it? That I think is going to be fascinating. But so let's say that we pencil in Lorenzo as a three down player on one side. How could it shake out? Do you think Ade could take control of it? Do you think it could be like a by committee thing with, uh, you know, guys kind of rotating in and out? I don't, I'm not sure how, how that could work out. Are you looking at, there's one position, there's Carter, and then there's one position battle at, at like at maybe the strong or the weak side, or are you looking at both being open? I kind of look at, I think Lorenzo is a lock in my opinion. Um, I think because of his experience, especially early in the season, I don't see how you don't have him on the field for a majority of the time. However, I will say this too. I think it also depends, like if we're saying Lorenzo is a lock, who's on the other side, I think it greatly depends on what Dean Pease is calling one and what the personnel on the other side is as well. I think that there, there's something that could be said about the way that Ade could specialize in one thing and uh, the, Arnold Ebiketti could specialize in another. But the thing about that is, is like Dean Pease loves to do different things and he doesn't want an offense to be able to pick up on got on what they're doing and what they're planning. And so I honestly, even saying that, I think that's not even remotely what they would try and do. And so, because you don't want to just run, let's say Arnold Ebiketti out there on a run play and be like, oh, well, there you go. When they know we're running the ball, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I, I will say that I do think there is an opportunity for that other side to be a bit more fluid according to what the play call is and what they need in the, in specific moments. Yeah. I, I look at this group and I think one, they have to get Dean Pease needs like the basics last year. They couldn't contain mobile quarterbacks. They weren't setting the edge. Well, there were a lot of basic problems that got the Falcons in trouble. They need the basics done. That's why I know it drove everybody crazy. That's why Steven means played so much. Let's yeah. be honest, Stephen Means is a fantastic human. And at that point, in his career was a bit unspectacular, but was always in the right place at the right time, right? At some point, if you're talking about just the base level requirements, you have to do that before you can yes. do anything else. So finding guys who can do that, earning trust and credibility over the course of all these joint practices, right? With the Jets and the Jags and these preseason games, we're going to see these guys are going to have an opportunity to prove they can do the basics. And then can they do the spectacular on top of it? So how all that pans out, I really think if I'm picking a quote unquote, like breakout, a possible breakout player on this defense, I look at Lorenzo Carter and I just like, I see his frame and I see his athleticism. You covered him at yeah. Georgia, right? I, I just see so much potential there. And I just think, this could be an eight or nine sack guy in this game, yeah. you know, yeah. if, if he can really uh, get it done. Um, we spent a lot of time on the edge rushers moving on to another thing that could be more of a rotational thing, or maybe we're going to see a straight up three down players at the inside linebacker spot. Talk a lot about the outside linebackers, inside linebackers. We have a lot of options, right? Troy Anderson <laughs> is super athletic and, fast as a jackrabbit really and you've got i don't know where that came from <laughs> um, cheetah i, I could have gone with cheetah maybe anything could have gone else? with so many so many so different many. like real animals <laughs> right yeah no i'm i mean at least i didn't say jackalope 
Uh, but that is true. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, um, you got Troy Anderson there. Rashawn Evans, a former first round pick, has experience. Nick Kwiatkowski, um, who I know a little bit from the Raiders, has starting experience, good backup. Um, Michael Walker, you, you talked to him this offseason. He is coming to play, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, from Michael- talking, and that doesn't even count Deion Jones. It sounds like Michael Walker is looking at this like, I don't care who they brought in. I'm going to go take one of those spots. Yeah, no, that's exactly how he's viewing it. And uh, I talked to him you know, kind of like what you're saying. I talked to him dur- uh, after practice, one of the mini camp practices, don't know which one it was, could have been together. any, <laughs> they all run together. Um, but I asked him like, do you feel like this year could be different for you? I, it, because Michael and I had talked last year about how the year didn't go the way that he wanted to. And, and I think he didn't have the playing time that he wanted to have. And so now transforming that to this year and knowing that there is an opportunity in front of you that hasn't been there the last two years, Michael Walker is ready to run through a brick wall in order to get one of those starting spots. I know we just talked about the starting rotation, like starting is not all that and uh, whatever. Michael Walker wants one of those spots and he is working like he needs it. And, And I think he does at this point in his career, he is just eating at the opportunity to get more opportunities in this defense. And, and I think that you saw, he he has the playmaker ability. I mean, you, you saw moments last year where he was making plays that you're like, I want more of that. And so for Michael Walker, he, we talk about Ade Ogundeji kind of being the, the question mark of the, the edge rushers. Michael Walker and his continued development is also a question mark. Can he be the guy? He he views himself as the guy. Can he be the guy in that room? That's where I think his trajectory is heading. Now we need to see what it actually looks like in that role. I don't want to rehash what we talked about last time because we talked about Deion Jones quite a bit. Yeah. And um, I think people appreciated the conversation. We saw that in the YouTube comments. Thank you guys for all the positivity there. I don't think we had a single dislike last week. It's always a win. Uh, but we talked a lot about Deion Jones and how he fits in there and if he fits in there or if he's going to be moved, right? We don't need to rehash all that. But how, let's say he's here and healthy. He's still Deion Jones, right? Right. And then it becomes less of a position battle if he's there because you assume he's going to take one of those spots. And then it puts a lot of pressure on the other one. Then you have almost too many qualified candidates. Um, at the same time, if you can go out and make a move and move on from Dion and get all these things that we talked about last week, something that if you can get something, take it at this point, right? (laughs) Just take it. You've built up this depth chart and enough, but he's the, he's the big question mark over the next couple of weeks about what they're going to do with him and how he fits. I do think that they're well situated for it. If he's there, Michael Walker is going to have a tough road to getting in the starting lineup. Cause you look at Rashawn Evans and he's like a Mike linebacker, right? Yep. (laughs) With a capital M I K E just like foyer, uh, Aluakin was last year. God, I miss that guy. Right. I know right? he was such a good dude. He's on the upward tra- like trajectory and it yeah. makes sense. Go get the bag, dude. And he did oh, yeah. that. But yeah. I think not having his personality, I think having Rashawn Evans there, who is a big personality, who knows his stuff, who can be a tone setter. You got to have that because I think losing foyer created a void that you yeah. have to fill somehow. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, yeah. From Foyer as well as anybody, right? I yeah. Mean, he was such a good player. From the thing about Foyer was it wasn't just like we saw the plays and everything. It was how he controlled the defense from a vocal standpoint. And because Dean Pease talked a lot about Foyer being the quote unquote quarterback of the defense, you needed someone that void in and of itself is very, very difficult to fix or to find a replacement for, because that is, you have to trust someone to get everybody lined up where they need to go to make the calls, to, to, ha- to be vocal with the secondary and with the guys up front. That part of the game is very important and it's very hard to replicate within somebody. So when Foyer goes to the Jags and like you said, like makes his money as he should, finding that replacement was so important. And Rashawn Evans is... I think 
the best you could have hoped for. 100%. Talking to Rashawn and knowing his history and knowing the type of player and the type of guy he is, he has that ability to be vocal within the defense and to and to do the things right that was another thing that I think Dean Pease talked about Boye a lot is like you told him one thing and he did it and there was if he made one mistake he never made that mistake again Rashawn Evans I think is kind of like that in in a lot of ways and so I think that part of it that part of the game almost the mental side just as much as the physical side was so important when you talk about having to replace Foye with Rashawn Evans. Yeah. And his history with Dean Pease definitely helps. He has so much mm-hmm. respect for the coordinator. He understands the, the scheme and how, and the schematics and how Dean likes to run it. All those things are key. And we've talked a lot about the front seven, I think, because if the front seven can figure it out, you look at the secondary and this isn't position battle talk necessarily, but you look at it and you think, okay, you got AJ Terrell and Casey Hayward still in his prime and Isaiah Oliver looked really good. And you think, okay, if the front seven can figure it out, the back end seems more secure, right? Mm-hmm. That maybe this defense can exceed expectations. And I think it's also a bonus that with all this talk that in no way are are the Falcons having to shove Troy Anderson into a thousand snap season, (laughs) right? That that that's not the type of pressure for a guy from, from a smaller school in Montana state, who's played a lot of different positions. Maybe he goes out there and earns it. And that's a bonus, but at no point have we said they're counting on this guy to do X, which is sort of what you're looking at Drake London. You're probably counting on him to play and have four figures in his receiving total. Arnold Ebicady, we're talking about some people thinking he's a three down guy. Maybe he doesn't have to be, but we're talking about the expectations dropping for a guy who's a second round pick. I think that's a bonus for Troy Anderson. I think the depth at linebacker and the fact that some guys are going to have to go earn some roles, I I think is a good thing. Can they figure out the front seven? That's going to be key. Can Mm -hmm. they figure out the quarterback spot? Now we're here. Um, Uh Which means you had to listen to most of the podcast to get here. Talk about teases and keeping people uh, glued. Uh, Nonetheless, Desmond Ritter, Marcus Mariota, this is as much as I have said, and I think you agree that it's Marcus Mariota seems like the heavy and odds on favorite to start the season as QB one. It doesn't change the fact that this remains an open competition. I think you wrote it back in March that Marcus Mariota was guaranteed literally nothing. Arthur Smith didn't say he's our starter. They go out and they draft Desmond Ritter and Desmond Ritter gets complimented on his mental acumen, which is the important part of the off season. It's, it's going to be a battle, I think. And Desmond Ritter is going to get a lot of opportunities this preseason to show what he has. The guy, I think there was a report that he was telling teams in pre-draft interviews, how he would unseat a veteran. Well, (laughs) here we go. This is the opportunity. They have two mobile quarterbacks uh, they have a hungry young kid. They have a guy trying to reestablish himself. Uh, I think the competition is going to get the best out of both guys. How are you looking at these quarterbacks um, heading into the training camp period? Yeah, I just think for Desmond at this point in his career, for Marcus at this point in his, in his career, the fact that the other guy in the room is Desmond and Marcus, I think is very good for Desmond and Marcus for all of the reasons that you just said. Desmond Ritter, we have talked to on a number of occasions. He wants to be a franchise quarterback. He wants that. He he very much believes that he can be that. We saw the emotion of that that draft call with Terry Fontenot when Desmond Ritter was like, man, they for lack of a better word, messed up. <laughs> that that <laughs> wasn't what he's keeping us PG 13. You know, I really want to get the expletive uh, note on the side of the iTunes uh, for our <laughs> podcast, but I'll, I'll save that for another time. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll go on another rant someday, <laughs> but not today with Desmond Ritter saying that. I think that that was very, very, the emotion of which you felt in that moment. And then also in the moment since that we've talked to him, this is something he wants. This is something that he very much feels like he is made for. So because of that, you have someone who feels this way, 
going up against someone who wants to resurrect his career and in Marcus Mariota. That is so good for both of them to push both of them. And I think that that part of it is so interesting when you're talking about this competition because for so long we haven't had that in Atlanta. Matt Ryan has been Matt Ryan and he was a lock since he got here. That is not the case right now. Even though I feel pretty confident that Marcus Mariota is going to be run out there week one, how much are we going to see Desmond Ritter? How much is he pushing Marcus? How quickly can Desmond get to that level? All of these questions are questions that we are going to be asking for an entire year. And that's something that I'm very excited about. And I do think that this is a really good situation for both Marcus and Desmond at, at, the, at this point in their respective careers. And uh, I bring this up, and this is a tough question to ask, uh, but Chase Paper from Rochester, New, New, New York, brought it up in the mailbag. I, I think it's a great point in that he said, I feel like we know what we have. And by we, I'm talking as Chase now. Hey, Chase, if you're out there. Um, <laughs> That, that he says the Falcons know that everybody knows what you're going to get in Marcus Mariota because he doesn't have a small sample size of starts, 64 starts in 70 plus games. Mm-hmm. You have seen him for a long time that maybe his ceiling is what he has shown. Now I defended, I argued back on that premise, but we've seen a lot of, of him in his NFL career that if we sort of know the rough that we have a good gauge of what he is and can be shouldn't the Falcons think bigger picture and try to give to, so you have a true understanding or a better understanding of what Desmond Ritter is and what maybe his ceiling is and what his development arc is heading into, I I know we're talking about position battles leading into training camp and I'm jumping right down a rabbit hole here, but (laughs) don't you need to know what you have? before you go into 2023, when you have like a bill, it's not just Bryce and CJ, there's a lot of good quarterbacks out there. So you have this thing, right? Arthur Smith, I think is going to look short term. Who's going to give me the best chance to beat the saints in week one. Yep. Full stop. Right. Yep. But when do you let the other part of it come into play? Right. That's the thing that I wonder. And I bring up a very small uh, tangential digression here it's too many words but you know i'm going off topic for one more second in 2014 uh i covered the raiders matt schaub someone that falcons know well was named the starter in like march and then Derek carr came in and swooped the starting job away that he's held for a billion years now at the last possible second and they realized we know what we have in schaub it's this i'm pointing to a relatively low ceiling and then Derek carr has potential we're going to go with Derek carr we're going to stink but we're going to do it right he's second round pick they, they went with Carr over a more established commodity that may have gotten them more wins. They thought a little big picture. When do you think big picture? Does any of that make any sense? Or have I talked too long that my point is now lost? No, <laughs> all, of that, all of that makes sense. And I think it's the question on a lot of people's minds. I think it's a question that this coaching staff in this front office are weighing too. When do you start thinking about that? If, you know, and I think it's going to be very interesting because I do think that at some point we will see Desmond Ritter. I'm not saying that we're never going to see Desmond Ritter. I do think we will see him. I think my thing is like, do we believe that Desmond Ritter is the future of this organization? And to that, I cannot answer one way or the other. Uh, This is not some, this is not somebody who was a top 10 draft pick. This is someone who is a 74th overall pick. Our uh, crazier things have happened and, and people a, a lot lower on the, the draft boards have gone on to be great quarterbacks. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that Desmond Ritter can't or won't be a great quarterback in this league. But to your point, when do you find out if he has that capability? Do you believe that he does now? If you do, then do you run him out there in week four? Like, I think that's all, that's, these are all the questions that, we, we will be able to get to later and down the road. It's a question that this coaching staff is currently, you know, maybe they're on a white sandy beach right now, but they are currently thinking about these questions and how much do you weigh short-term versus the long-term goal? And that's very, very interesting. I think it's the age old saying or whatever it is, is that coaches think in the short-term general managers think in the long-term. 
what does that mean? How does that work? How does Terry Font know and what he thinks this organization can be coincide with what Arthur Smith needs them to be in 2022? Yeah, it's, it's going to be a fun topic, I think, probably for a long time. Um, but getting back to the, to, to the, you know, I, I exploded the, the question and expanded it. Getting back to that, I, I do think that you probably, that Arthur Smith will think, how can I beat the Saints, right? And I think that that's the important question in deciding who gets that opportunity. I also push back a little bit and say, look, Marcus Mariota was, he was a dynamic college player. I know there's lots of dynamic college players who don't go on to be excellent pros, but he was drafted number two overall. The Titans obviously saw something. This is a guy that's won a playoff game. It's a guy that's gone, uh, that's, that's produced winning records. Things got a little askew on him and he got a little banged up. And I think that we're going to see the best of Marcus Mariota. What the best of Marcus Mariota is, where that ceiling is, I think we're going to find out. Yeah. And, he, and he's either going to thrive and exceed it, or he's going to be, he was who we thought he was, right? Mm -hmm. But these are the questions that are going to be interesting as we move through camp. Um, and as we see him perform, these joint practices are going to be important. I bet we see both guys in the preseason games and we see them continue on and how that competition heads into camp or goes through camp and then how it extends throughout the course of the regular season when we see Ritter, if we see Ritter. Um, I think all that stuff is going to be fascinating. So we're coming up against it here. Um, and like I said, at the start, Tori and I are going on a little summer vacation, KIT and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> and we're going to come back the week before training camp and we're going to hit it hard every single week. We have plans for Falcons final whistle that are like the coolest. Let's be yeah. honest. Um, we're talking about live podcasts at training camp. We're talking about player guests. We're talking about mini series. One's already been recorded and it's super freaking awesome. <laughs> starring Tori McElhaney on like heat. Uh, so we're going to be doing a lot of different and really cool stuff with the podcast after we, after these messages, after we take a little bit of a break and we'll be coming back rejuvenated, uh, excited about what's to come with an extra member of the team. So Yay. all those things are going to be awesome. Guys, thank you so much. Why don't you subscribe and uh, rate and review and all that fun stuff and get us pumped and get us ready uh, for Falcons Final Whistle coming back full time in late July. Thank you guys so much for listening. Tori, any final thoughts? Because I've just been ranting forever. I mean, over the next two weeks, to all of our listeners, go be kind to someone. Go, <laughs> yes. go make someone smile one day. You have however many weeks until we come back i want to hear about the person that you did something nice for spread some kindness out there be right. kind and, to your fellow neighbor and maybe do what we're doing get away from football for a little bit yeah. come back rejuvenated pumped and ready to go uh thank you guys so much and we'll talk to you in a few weeks <laughs>